All righty. Well, I've just about got seven o'clock, so we'll get going. Uh, my name is Tim Gibbs. I'm the executive director of the Delaware Academy of Medicine and the Delaware Public Health Association. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all to Delaware Mini Medical School 2022. And let me go to the next slide here. All righty. Um, just a little bit about Minimed. Uh, we restarted this program in 2009 uh, after a break from about 15 or 20 years. And in 2011, our partners, Christiana Care, uh, were welcomed as uh, you know, a long-term member of the team that provides Mini Medical School to the community. We're truly grateful uh, for the contribution of the External Affairs Department and of course of the clinical expertise who you'll be hearing uh, from throughout this series uh, this spring. Um, uh, the course goes for six weeks. Uh, based on the registration numbers, this will be the largest class ever. Uh, I note that right now uh, there are 364 uh, people who are in the room and that number continues to grow uh, rapidly. That's gr very gratifying to us. At the conclusion, uh, you will have, if you've attended all classes, uh, you're eligible to receive a certificate of attendance. Dr. Smith, who I'm gonna turn the mic to over in a minute, will tell you more about that process. Uh, there is no continuing medical education credit offered with the series. Uh, so if you're here hope, hoping for CME, I'm afraid this is not the right place for you. And attending mini medical school doesn't qualify you for any particular job, but it does look great on a college application. Uh, and part of our outreach is specifically to middle, junior and high school students. And of course, to undergrad students who are considering a career in the health sciences broadly, and in particular, those who are interested in becoming a physician, a nurse or another high-end terminal degree. Uh, we welcome learners of all ages. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the objectives for this course, uh, participants should be able to discuss ways the human body works, identify medical advances which have changed our understanding of disease and health, and then recognize where cutting edge uh, medical research is headed. And then for each of our six speakers, they're going to dive into a particular uh, area. And again, just to note, that's what the certificate achievement will look like, uh, more or less. We might change the decorations around the edge. Uh, but anyway, there you have it. And uh, I will now turn it over. I'm going to stop sharing, turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kate Smith, who will take you through some housekeeping details. Over to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. All right, my turn to show my screen. Um, get used to this screen because this will be how you are welcomed um, for the next five weeks. And so that you remember, I'll, I'll make sure that all of these things stay there, but I did want to take you through it uh, today just so that everybody's aware and everybody has the same expectations to start. So this is what our semester looks like. Um, this is obviously the first week. This is trauma-informed care. Um, this is going to be given by Dr. Suzanne Bauer, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, but a couple of odds and ends. If you haven't done so already, please change your name, um, your participant name, to the full name that you use to register for the course. That makes my life a whole lot easier if I don't have to look at things like James's iPad and try and guess who it belongs to. In order to do that, at the bottom of your screen, you can click on participants, hover over your name, which should be at the top of the list, choose more, and then click rename. Uh, if you can't do that for whatever reason, just pop your name into the chat. Um, please stay on mute throughout the presentation. I have uh, set it so that everybody's muted upon entry and that way we don't get um, background noises or anything like that. And we will hold all questions until the end of the presentation. This will give Dr. Bauer and our future speakers time to um, make sure that they've got through what they want to get through. And then at the end, we do have time for questions. If you want to ask a question, you can do it two ways. You can either pop it into the chat, and I will uh, keep an eye on it there. Um, or you can click the raise hand button. Some of you have already done that. That's great. Um, 
I'm going to put them down so that we can have the presentation, but feel free to raise them again um, as we get towards the end or um, to ask a question. Um, these sessions are being recorded. They will be made available at DelawareMiniMed.org after each session. It won't be immediately after, um, but within a few days it will be there. Attendance, I know you all want to know this quest, these answers, so here we go. Attendance will be taken in the following manner. If you are attending by Zoom, you must enter your full name, and if you are a high school student, you must enter your school into the Zoom chat by 715. So you should be starting to do that now. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. If you are attending via telephone and you want to get credit for attending, you must email 4, 9 o'clock tonight with the code word of the day, which I'll tell you in a minute. At the end of the six week session, um, which you have to attend all six sessions to get credit, at the end of the six week session, we will send out a survey. And by the next day at six o'clock, so you have like 22 and a half hours to take it, you must fill out that survey and have it sent in. Those are all the things that you need to do to get credit for attendance. Um, if you want a certificate of participation, that's what you have to do. If you don't want a certificate, you can ignore everything that I just said and just enjoy the evening. Um, but if you do want a certificate, you must do those things. If you are, um, if you can't attend for some reason, please email me and let me know and we will make accommodations for you. But it, just watching them online after everything is done is not enough to get a certificate, okay? So for today, our week one code word is SNOW, S-N-O-W. So if you are calling in, send me an email by nine o'clock tonight with code word, I was there, code word SNOW. Um, you don't have to put obviously code word SNOW in the chat because I know what it is. Um, but now let's move on to why you're all here. Um, Dr. Suzanne Bauer is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in evaluation and treatment of children, adolescents, and adults with autism spectrum disorder. She graduated from the University of Washington with a BS in psychology. She graduated with a PsyD, and I see now I have her degree wrong. I'm very sorry, my mistake. A PsyD and a JD from Widener University's Joint Law and Psychology Program in 2008. She worked in an autism specific clinic in Philadelphia, overseeing therapeutic preschool and conducting evaluations for autism for 10 years before coming to Christiana Care. Dr. Bauer has been with Christiana Care since 2019, and she created the multidisciplinary autism program with the team's psychiatrist and social worker to serve the unique needs of this population. Together, they consult with various departments within the hospital regarding patient care. She is also a co-chair of the Diverse Abilities ERG with Christi Christiana Care. So Dr. Bauer, I will stop sharing my screen and you can take it away. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. So it's, it's not an ERG, it does look like that. It's an ERG, which is an employee resource group, which I didn't know about until I heard about, and then I got really excited and joined it. Um, but I can talk a little bit more about what got me to here today after we talk about trauma-informed care. So I'm gonna share my screen, bear with me. I'm not super awesome at this. I can just, there we go. All right. Can you guys see it? You're all on mute. So I'm just going to. Yes, we can. Up. Yes. Okay, good. I was like, I just asked a bunch of people that can't answer me. That's not good. Okay. So um, I'm Suzanne Bauer, and we're going to talk about trauma informed care. Okay. So to get into trauma informed care, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of background prior to talking about what is trauma informed care. So this idea came out of a study that was done, it was started in 1994 and it was completed in 1998 in San Diego, California. And Kaiser Permanente, an insurance group, um, interviewed about 17,000 people about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Um, it's a very well-known study by those in the field. And they picked 10 specific forms of childhood trauma. And the reason that why they picked those was they were frequently reported by the, um, the people that they were insuring. And there was already some research on every one of these different areas and how they could affect people. So they wanted to see how often 
do people experience these forms of trauma? Do they experience more than one form of trauma? Is there any trends that sort of go with the experience of trauma in childhood? Um, and so 10 of them were personal forms of trauma, things that happened to that individual themselves, physical, verbal, or sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect. So, so bad things that have happened to children. Um, the other five were things that were sort of happening in the family around the child themselves. So a parent who's an alcoholic, a maternal victim of domestic violence, they didn't actually look at paternal victims, which happen, but are less frequent than maternal victims, a family member in jail, a family member with a diagnosed mental health condition or parental divorce. Um, and so they just asked people to say, do you have one of these, any one of these? And so your score could either be, you could be anywhere from zero to 10. Um, and what they found was the higher the score, this is, this is probably obvious, the higher the score, the more likely the child will have negative experiences and negative consequences of those experiences. Um, the idea of this was not to say these are the only types of trauma that a child could experience, but it was sort of to give a guideline of well, what does that mean? And how do we tie all of these things that happen in childhood to things that happen in adulthood and outcomes for people? And to give sort of a guideline as to what do we do with that when it happens? So just to give you a little bit of information about it, from the original study, that's this one over here, 64% of people in San Diego, California had in this study, had at least one adverse experience. Maybe somebody was divorced, maybe there's alcohol use in the family. Um, they had personally experienced some sort of abuse or something like that. 12 and a half percent of the people that were interviewed had four or more. And the reason why four is an important number is they found that once an individual has four of these adverse experiences, they're more likely to have a negative health outcome or a negative emotional health outcome in the future. Now, the reason why I show these two different graphs is, um, so that study was done in the late 90s. In about 2012, it was replicated in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is the poorest large city in America. And so there are a lot of risk factors that go into individuals who live in Philadelphia that are related to trauma. Things like low income, um, being a minority, being a marginalized individual, having a disability, being a female, all increase the likelihood that you'll experience one of these ACEs. And so they looked at this group, they interviewed um, individuals from this group, from this population, and they found that the levels were much higher. So if you think about it from the, um, the two studies, most kids, so I have kids, right? And I think I try to kind of like, hmm, what would this mean in their classroom? So my kids, their classrooms are somewhere, let's say about 20 kids, right? That means that in the original study, in the ACEs study, more than half of the kids in that class um, had experienced some form of a trauma. And, a, and two, about two out of the 20 kids had had four or more traumas. But in Philadelphia, that means more like six or seven of those kids, like a third of those kids had had four or more traumas and almost all of them had had some sort of a trauma. Um, so these, um, when, oh, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the next slide, but um, with trauma, trauma is the experience of some sort of event or series of events that can be ongoing trauma that's either emotionally disturbing, it's scary, it's anxiety provoking, or it's life threatening. You literally could have died from this experience. And what typically happens in your body is either fight, flight, or freeze. We usually think of fight or flight. Freeze is also a response, sort of that deer in headlights, your brain shuts off and you can't do anything, you're immobilized. Now that reaction is totally normal. What happens for people who experience trauma and ongoing trauma especially is that they continue to have that experience, even when things are not actually threatening or not even a trauma. They remind them of the trauma that has happened and they continue with these patterns over and over time. With small children, it can actually rewire their brain. So it can lead to problems with short-term memory, emotional regulation, things like planning, um, impulse control, things like that. And so these kids not only have they experienced trauma and they're having these negative reactions, but then their brain isn't able to develop at the same 
rate or in the same ways that the other kids around them are. So they're sort of being set back even more because they're having these challenges. Um, and over time, the stressors that you're experiencing sort of overwhelm you, right? And you no longer have good coping skills to manage the stress that you're dealing with. Um, so not only do they look at these ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences, and they're listed here as the sort of tree part, um, but then adverse community environments. And this is where the difference sort of between San Diego and Philadelphia came, came into light, is that things like poverty, discrimination, disruptions in your community, lack of resources or upward mobility, violence, poor housing, things like that can really further impact a child. And the comparison, just financially and in terms of minority dis, um, distribution within those two cities, San Diego at the time um, had 8.7% of the people in San Diego live below the poverty level. In 2012, more than 28% of the people in Philadelphia lived below the poverty level. So it's just very distinct environments. And in San Diego, 35% of the population was non-white or a minority population, but 60% of the population in Philadelphia is a minority or non-white population. So it helps to, to shed light on why their um, percentages were so different and the experiences of those children. Um, but there's a good thing, right? So this is not gonna all be doom and gloom tonight. So, Many children experience negative or adverse experiences, but not all of them have negative outcomes. Not all of them develop emotional problems. Not all of them have behavioral problems, academic problems, all of these things that we're really worried about. And there was another study that was in 2019 that looked at why. And what they really examined was positive childhood experiences, right? And so it's tipping the scales. Um, and in this study, what they looked at or things that helped a child become resilient, to help them flourish despite the, the adversity that they're experiencing. And these were the questions that they asked. They asked these of adults, did you experience this when you were a child? So were you able to talk to your family about your feelings? Did you feel your family stood behind you in difficult times? Did you enjoy, community, enjoy participating in community traditions? Do you have, did you have a sense of belonging in high school? Did you feel supported by your friends? Do you have at least two non-parent adults who took a genuine interest in you? And did you feel safe and protected by at least one adult in your home? And so what this does is it really offsets some of the, the factors that were in the adverse childhood experiences, right? So if you had, an abusive situation in your home, but you had one adult in that home where you could go for refuge, you have a very strong protective factor. If you had two individuals in your life and they could be teachers, they could be coaches, they could be mentors, it could be your pastor or your rabbi, it could be anybody in your life that took a genuine interest in you, really wanted to know about you. It brings value to that person. You're meaningful. That offset a lot of the negative that went along with um, neglect and abuse, things like that. Maybe it was outside of your family. Maybe it was that you had connection with your friends or you had connection with your community. Um, or despite the challenges that were happening in your family, that there was a divorce or maybe somebody was in jail or had mental health, but your family would really listen to you and listen to your feelings that cared about that, it offset those um, negative situations. And so what what people started to really look at, well, okay, so you kind of, you have this balance. Everybody ends up with this balance of positive and negative in their childhood. And what does that do for you long-term? It has to be correlated with what happens with the rest of your life, right? Maybe it would help us understand why some people go on to live more healthy and happy lives and why some people have a lot of struggles despite the fact that physically they kind of look the same, right? So, there we go. Um, this is the hypothesis. This is the guess about how ACEs impact people over time. 
So at the bottom of the pyramid, we're looking at those adverse childhood experiences. Do you have any trauma? Do you have abuse, neglect? Do you have challenges within your family? Um, was your community a, um, a difficult place for you to grow up and thrive? And so that's sort of your foundation. That's what you were given to start and to build your life and your resilience with. And what that does is it can cause social, emotional, and cognitive impairments, right? So if you have, because you're, you've been so worried your whole life about staying safe, that you put most of your mental resources into that, and you didn't develop things like short-term memory or good planning and organizational skills, that might put you at a, an impairment level as compared to other people that didn't experience that. Or maybe because you experience emotional neglect or emotional abuse, you have difficulty regulating your own emotions. And so you have emotional challenges or because other people hurt you in your life or people were unstable and came in and out of your life, you had difficulty trusting those around you and making strong connections with others. Um, and so you develop these social, emotional and cognitive impairments. Well, most people don't like to feel that way, right? So we don't like to experience these things and we cope with it in positive and negative ways. Right. So if you for people who are having emotional challenges, maybe they're feeling depressed, they're feeling anxious, they're feeling angry, something like that. There are ways to cope with those feelings. There's really positive ways. I'm a therapist. I think therapy is a really positive way to do that. Um, taking a deep breath, engaging in self-care, going for a walk, things like that. There's also a lot of negative behaviors that you can engage in to cope with the challenges in your life. It could be things like substance abuse, um, promiscuity or, or poor sexual um, safety behaviors, um, eating over or under eating, uh, not taking your care of your body, like poor exercise, you could develop insomnia. You could also have sort of more interpersonal challenges, like being very dependent on other people and not having your own sort of um, confidence and self-sufficiency. You could have poor boundaries where maybe you're over willing to share or get into relationships very quickly with other people. Um, maybe it causes financial problems for you. Maybe you don't see the doctor, all of those kinds of things, right? So you have these negative health behaviors or health risk behaviors, right? All of these behaviors put you at risk for negative health, health outcomes, either physically, mentally, emotionally. And then from there, disease, disability, and social problems develop, right? So if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not feeding yourself good food, you're not sleeping, you're not exercising, um, maybe you're overusing substances like drugs or alcohol, you're smoking, you're putting yourself at higher risk for things like um, diabetes, liver problems, obesity, things like that. You could also, because of the way that you deal with stress or negative emotions, be at a higher risk for developing something like anxiety or depression. Um, the risk of suicidal behavior is much higher in this group as well, right? And so all of these things are putting you, putting these people at a higher risk of negative behavior, of um, negative outcomes. And then the end cap is this population dies earlier than individuals who don't have the same level of adverse experiences, adverse childhood experiences. And so what we wanna do is stop that, right? This is not the trajectory that people should go on, especially because this was sort of the lot they were given, right? This was not some, it was not a choice that anyone made. It was not something that um, they knowingly walked into or asked for. This was something that happened to this person and through this chain of events could lead to earlier death and a less satisfactory life over time. And as helping professionals, we don't wanna have that happen. Um, so here's a list of things that um, are related to higher, um, a higher level, a higher number of ACEs within um, it, your rating of ACEs as a child. Um, so some of these things that I've talked about, and many of them are, like I said, related to the actual behaviors that people engage in that many times are actually coping, an effort to cope with the experience that they've had and the trauma that they've had, um, and, and are clearly negative coping behaviors, but they're 
the only way this person knows how to cope with the behaviors at this point. Okay, so what are the risks of not using trauma-informed care? So status quo that we had just talked about. So imagine this patient who has had, let's say four adverse experiences as a child. They have had, um, they've developed trauma as a result. They have difficulty trusting those around them, especially maybe people in authority. They um, tend to experience questions of their judgment or questions of their behavior as um, overly critical, maybe. Um, these uh, patients also are very quick to, can be, can be very quick to um, end a relationship if it doesn't feel safe for them in an effort to protect themselves. Um, and sometimes they can do the opposite where they become overly sort of invested and maybe it feels sort of clingy, like um, very um, calling a lot and, and wanting to be very involved with their caregivers in a way that um, is also not appropriate, right? So when you have a patient like that, it can be difficult to give care recommendations that the person is willing to follow. It's, it's difficult for the person maybe to have even just the resources available to follow those recommendations. Maybe they're sort of at their wit's end all the time. Um, they may abruptly discontinue care or kind of go to various doctors. They may, may use the emergency department rather than using an ongoing primary care doctor. Um, and as a result, they continue to have those negative health outcomes, right? So um, let's say this individual compensates for um, their trauma and their experience of trauma by overeating, um, using substances, um, maybe not exercising and engaging in risky behaviors, right? Well, we would certainly want to help that patient figure out how to have more healthy behaviors because many of those lead to high to risk of negative health outcomes. But if asking them questions about maybe their eating habits or how many drinks that they, they have a day or a week lead them to feel um, re-traumatized, right? That I'm back in the situation where I was being maybe berated by an adult in my life, I don't want to be, I don't want to see you anymore. So they stop seeing the doctor and they continue to have those negative health behaviors, develop diabetes, maybe develop liver disease, something like that. And, and the cycle continues. The other side of this coin is the caregivers. Caregivers who continue to hear these negative stories without being able to help, especially without being able to help, the individuals who are sharing these stories are at risk of vicarious traumatization. And what that means is if I hear these stories from my patients, I'm actually being traumatized because I'm hearing it and I'm hearing these traumas over and over again because I care and I empathize and I want to help. I feel powerless to be able to help them. Um, and when people feel that level of trauma, taking it on from someone else, it's, it can be very real. It leads to burnout. It can also lead to things to like exhaustion, mental exhaustion, emotional, physical exhaustion. Um, and then people engage in coping behaviors for that. Maybe they, um, or they become overwhelmed, right? They become angry and irritable. Maybe they check out and just kind of stop listening to these negative stories um, and don't feel as connected and empathic with other people. They could become easily frustrated, depression, anxiety. But can you imagine if somebody who is coming in, a patient who is coming in already having been traumatized, sees a provider or even the front desk staff who have experienced this level of trauma from other people sort of day in and day out, without being able to help and they're disconnected, kind of not really paying attention, not making eye contact, not really even smiling. Um, how is that trauma survivor going to feel, right? So we're just gonna continue the trauma over and over again. And we're just gonna keep, it's like trauma hot potato. The person who is traumatized sort of gives some of their trauma to the caregiver and the caregiver doesn't want it 
anymore because that that doesn't feel good. So they kind of throw it to somebody else. Um, those negative feelings, which might trigger the next person. And we kind of just keep throwing it and throwing it and throwing it back and forth to each other. Um, and this scenario is where trauma-informed care came from. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about what is a trauma-informed care and how do we break that cycle? Now, I know we had talked about taking a break. And so I just wanna make sure that um, I'm being mindful of that. Um, Kate, do we need to take a break? No, I think you're good. Okay. Okay. I know you had, he would mention it for a break. So I just want to, if anybody had to go potty. No, I, like I, I think we're okay. Okay, good. It's only been half okay. an hour. They should be able to hold it longer. Than All that. right. <laughs> well, I don't know. Some of us can't. We're getting That's, older. All right. That's true. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to show you guys a short video. It's just a couple minutes and it gives, um, some information about trauma-informed care, and then we'll dive into it a little bit more. And it's a cartoon, so it's cute. Hold on, if I can get it. Just make sure if it's like a video or something, Dr. Brower, that you mm -hmm. share the um, sound as well. Okay. So you can like start if when you click oh, click okay. share screen again, and there will be a little button that uh, you click down at the bottom that says share sound. Okay. Let me see if I can get it going first because we might okay. hold up. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to get this. Could you guys hear the audio for that or no? I haven't heard anything yet. Hold on. Let me see. Let me, I'm going to start playing it again and I want to let me know if you can hear it. Nope, can't hear anything. Okay, I do not know how to share audio. Would you like me to try? Yes, I would. If you much. put the if you put the YouTube link in the chat, I can try pulling it up. Okay, perfect. Technical difficulties. We're gonna mm -hmm. <laughs> we're gonna That's roll. Life. Yes, very much. Okay. There we go. Okay. Bias cover. All right, I got it. Thank you for the advice. Um, I have not had to share audio before, so I appreciate everyone's suggestions. All right, let me go back here. Know the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover? Well, the same is true when you assess a patient. Hi, I'm Dr. Cruz. Early in my career, I noticed a pattern with some of my patients. They often had multiple health issues, were uneasy during office visits, and frequently visited the emergency department. But worst of all, they never got better despite multiple visits. Then I realized something. From an early age, many of my patients were exposed to trauma and adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. This includes emotional, sexual, or physical abuse, violence, neglect, discrimination, poverty, and other adverse events. ACEs are more common in the U.S. than you'd think. In fact, 60% of U.S. adults have one ACE, 25% have three or more ACEs, and 16% have four or more. ACEs occur in all socioeconomic groups, but are more common in low-income and minority populations. For young children, repeated exposure to trauma can impact brain development and literally rewire the brain's response to stress. So as they grow up, many struggle with issues related to emotional regulation, like depression, anxiety, or substance use disorders. Trauma survivors are also more often at risk for chronic diseases, behavioral health problems, and even suicide. Knowing all this, I began to rethink my approach to care. Instead of asking patients, what's wrong with you? I ask, what happened to you? Recognizing that life experiences are often a root cause of poor health is integral to improving patient care. Trauma-informed care has helped me take these experiences into account 
providing greater insight into my patients' needs and how to address them. Here are five key ways that healthcare organizations can gradually integrate trauma-informed care into their practices to help patients and staff. First, build awareness and generate buy-in. Involve both staff and patients in adopting a trauma-informed approach. Second, invest in a trauma-informed workforce. Hire staff that embrace trauma-informed care and provide training not only for clinical staff, but also for non-clinical employees like front desk workers or security guards who are often the face of your organization. Next, create an environment that is safe and welcoming for patients and staff. Engage patients in meaningful ways. Ask how they feel and listen. You can also build trust by involving them in their own treatment planning. Finally, identify and treat trauma. Consider a screening approach that works for your patients and ensure that treatments and referral sources are available. These changes take time, but each step improves our ability to connect with and care for patients. Today, our patients appreciate the changes we've made. Plus, our staff is more in tune with patients, so work is less stressful and more rewarding. Trauma-informed care. It can truly transform the caregiving experience from being treaters to being healers. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna re-share my screen and pick up where we left off. Oh boy, let me see, hold on. All right. Okay, all right, so that's where we left off. Um, oops, there we go. Okay, so um, as she kind of alluded to in the video, there's a lot of benefits to a trauma-informed approach and they're for the patient as well as the provider. So, um, and I noticed somebody in the chat really liked the question, what happened to you versus what's wrong with you? So, I mean, just listen to that for yourself. If you came into my office and you were asking for help, and maybe this is something that you've needed help with for a really long time, and you have a really hard time asking for people for help and being vulnerable, and somebody says, what's wrong with you? That automatically sort of puts people on edge, puts them on the defensive versus, well, what happened to you? Um, and this doesn't have to be about the person's trauma. This can be about whatever symptom they're coming in with. So for many people who experience trauma, um, their emotional symptoms can be demonstrated through their body. It's called somatization. So headaches, stomach aches, um, racing heart, um, tense muscles or like pain in your jaw from grinding your teeth, things like that. Um, and if you come in with this cluster of symptoms and they're like, well, what's wrong with you? Or it, even if just the question, because they wanna know your symptoms, what's wrong with you? Um, feels very different than, than what's been going on, what's happened, what's happened to you? Because then it sort of takes the fault away from the individual. What's wrong with you can feel very, very accusatory. Um, as opposed to you've had these experiences and you're dealing with it. Tell me about it so we can understand together. Um, and trauma-informed care is really about bringing two people together in a safe and nurturing environment so that they can solve a problem or, or get through a situation together in a way that would have sort of mimics what would have been more healthy for that individual young, in their younger life. It can also help the provider. So whether um, myself as a caregiver, um, at Christiana Care, we, care, we call everyone who works at the hospital a caregiver, whether it is um, the, the a, a doctor in the hospital, whether it is the people in the, that work in the cafeteria, the people that change the trash cans, everyone here is a caregiver because we help the care of our patients together. Um, now, if any one of those people is interacting with a patient who um, is feeling traumatized by the experience that they've had in our hospital, it's gonna have a negative outcome for the people around them as well. And it can lead to either burnout, um, it can lead to a lot of staff turnover. And so for an organization, it's something that we need to think about as well. So here are 
sort of breaking down the, the five principles of trauma-informed care. And the first is safety, because fundamentally, all of the things that we talked about in terms of ACEs are about lack of safety, your physical safety, your emotional safety, um, you maybe financial safety. Are you going to live in a place? Are you going to be able to stay in your home? Are you going to be moving around a lot? Are the people in your lives going to be reliable and steady in your life? And so the first and most fundamental part is to ensure that the environment that the people walk into, our patients walk into, is safe. Is it physically a safe environment? So making sure that um, there are clear indications that thing or, things are safe. So when you walk into um, a new place, one of the first things that you notice is the parking lot if, or um, sort of like curb appeal if you're taking transit or you're walking, right? So um, the outside area before you've even walked in, if it doesn't seem like it's well cared for, well lit, that there are um, happy people kind of walking around, it's going to impact your level of safety in that environment. Same with being in the actual physical environment of the um, office that you go in. And then there's things like psychological safety. So psychological safety is um, feeling free to express your thoughts, your questions, um, and not being judged or criticized for those things. Um, and many people who have experienced trauma, some of the trauma is that criticism of their own experiences or belittling of their experiences or minimizing that, that it is actually negative for them. So we want to have a really warm, open environment. If you're going in to see a, a physician or a therapist or someone like that, that it's, uh, that it's a confidential area that no one else is going to be overhearing or seeing what's going on in there, especially if you're giving a physical exam, something like that. And that we make it clear that we really respect that. We respect the pri your privacy and we think that you are entitled and deserving of a safe place where you feel comfortable. Okay, so second, choice. Many people who experienced trauma had no autonomy, control, choice over what happened to them. And so making that very explicit is really important. So in care, it is the patient's choice, right? I, as a clinician, might feel absolutely 100% you should do this one thing. That's what I would do. That's not necessarily what the patient would do. And I have to make that clear. I also want to make sure that they know the positives and the negative negatives of any choice that they're making so that they can be informed about the, any choice that they're going to make. And then once they do make that choice, help to support them in um, what like the consequences of that might be. So if I, for instance, feel like some course of therapy might be really important for this patient and they don't want to do that. Okay. We don't have to do that. Here's some alternatives or here are my concerns about what might happen as a result of that. And here's how we're going to deal with that. So that, or here's suggestions about how we might deal with that because the next part is collaboration. Um, and in terms of collaboration, um, so for a provider and an individual, right? We're both coming in with areas of expertise. My area of expertise is in psychology. I'm a psychologist, that's what I do. Um, but a patient that's coming in to see me and um, like my bio had said, I typically see individuals who have autism. So either the person or the family that is coming in to see me may not be a specialist in autism, but they're a specialist in themselves and their family. And I don't know them. I don't know what their family is like. I don't know what their traditions are like. I don't know what happens in their home. So we take my knowledge about autism and their knowledge about their family, and we put those two things together as a team, an equal partnership to figure out, well, now what do we do with that? Knowing all these things together, what's gonna to become the right out outcome for you? And that means that there's sort of an equal sharing of power. And um, this is not sort of the old school approach of, I'm the professional, I'm gonna tell you what to do, you just go get it done. Because that sort of has the flavor of <clears throat> some of these prior relationships that the individual might have had, right? It also means I might miss information because the individual is too scared to share that information with me and it might completely change the picture and they don't know, maybe they don't know that that would change the picture for me and I don't know that information is there. And so we both, it's like a lose-lose situation. Um, 
I, there was a great example that I came across in doing this research um, to, to put this together. Um, there's an organization, it's, it's out of California, and um, the, one of the examples that they gave was an a very, very anxious individual who had experienced trauma and um, described being in a dental chair as being a compromised situation. And, you know, you think you're in a dental chair, you're laying back, there's usually sort of like arms around you and the tray over the top of you. So it's not easy to move. Somebody's looming over you with like lights and gadgets and things like that. Um, and so to be trauma informed, what they did is they worked together to help the person identify what aspects of their dental care were they comfortable with and what aspects were they not comfortable with and how could they alert the dentist when they were sort of starting to feel uncomfortable and then what would happen, right? And so they went through all these different, okay, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, right? These are the steps of your dental exam. So how do, we, how do we do this together? And they didn't proceed with the dental exam until they had a plan that everybody agreed to um, and it allowed the person to feel more in control of the situation. They had a voice, they had choice in what happened. They felt safe, they collaborated on that. And it was trustworthy, right? Because they were open, they were transparent about what was happening. Um, these are the stages of a dental exam, not get in the chair, just open your mouth, it's gonna be fine, right? So they were very transparent about what would happen. They were calm and taking their time. They were warm and friendly and let the person know that they would proceed at their own pace. Um, it's important to be consistent, to do what you say you're gonna do and do it every time. Um, even things like all the forms that patients have to fill out when they come to see us, um, consents to treatment, releases of information. Your information is private unless you say we can share it with someone else. Um, that we keep your records private and secure. Um, I don't talk about you with other people in the break room when I'm having coffee. I have these professional boundaries. And just like I'm not going to talk about other patients or talk about you to other patients, I'm not going to talk about other patients to you. So we show that you can trust us with your personal information by the way that we act in our demeanor. And then last was empowerment. So empowerment is all of these things are really important, but in the end, we want the patient to be able to take these on their own and use it out in the world, not just in our office. So if a patient has had this sort of um, this experience and they realize that it feels different and it has given them um, a level of autonomy and a level of confidence and a level of security, they can go advocate for that in other environments, whether it's other caregivers, whether it's their personal environments, their work environment, whatever it happens to be, their family environment, that they know a different experience of relationships with other people, and they can take that and use that to further their life. It also helps to empower them to look into other kinds of care that's related to trauma, right? And so trauma-informed care can inform all kinds of care, right? It can inform, um, like I said, going to the dentist, it can inform, there was um, information about HIV clinics, there was, we use it here in our behavioral health clinic, all these kinds of things. Um, but there is specific trauma-related therapies. And so sometimes um, creating this relationship with the patient um, and having them feel safe and heard and held in a positive relationship, the way that you know, we would have hoped that they would have when they were younger, may allow them to feel comfortable enough to get treatment for that trauma so that it's no longer impacting them on a daily basis the way that it has been. So what are the benefits of trauma-informed care? We've kind of talked about this a little bit. Increased safety and trust for the patient so they feel safe and trusting towards their caregivers. They also feel trusted in return um, and that level of safety and trust allows some of those defenses that they have been using and maybe don't even know that they've been using because they, those defenses may be keeping people at arm's length or not giving a lot of information about themselves were really, really useful when they were younger, but have become less useful over time because they're not actually experiencing that trauma or hopefully are not experiencing that trauma anymore. And as they feel more safe and 
trusted or trust trust the people that they're with, um, those defenses can come down and they can be a little bit more open. They can feel safe being a little bit more vulnerable and trusting with other people. Um, that may then allow them to be more open about their symptoms and their health behaviors. So, um, you know, if a person is coming in with specific health concerns with their physician, but they're not actually being open or truthful about the behaviors that they do at home, maybe what their um, lifestyle behaviors are, um, whether or not they're actually taking their medication as prescribed, are they taking other medications, things like that, then the physician is not working with all the information that they need because the person is feeling a need to sort of keep that information close to the close to the best, right? Um, private for themselves. And so if they can be more open, then all more of the information is available to make an appropriate decision together. Um, and with that, with that trusting and respectful and supportive relationship, the individuals are more likely to adhere to the recommendations. You know, you should take this blood pressure medication. It will really help with X, Y, and Z. I know you're a little wary about taking medications. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about your concerns. Um, and we can weigh out the pros and cons and you can decide. Maybe we write the prescription and you, and you think about it to decide if you want to fill that prescription in the future. Um, you know, and we, and we do this as a collaborative effort. Um, it also helps the staff. So staff are more understanding and engaged with the patients. Um, they kind of see where they're coming from. This isn't a problem patient that is always calling and being demanding about they want this thing right now, or um, they make an appointment and then never come, right? And those kinds of frustrations in the office, they understand where that's coming from and they take a kind, and supportive approach that then maybe gets the patients more engaged and helping other people feels good. It, it's, a, it's a mood lifter. It's something that um, has really positive psychological benefits for other people. And so it creates this environment within the, the practice of not only if you're encouraging other people to care for themselves and being caring and supportive and warm, you should probably do that for yourself and we should probably do it for each other. So, um, Hey, you look like maybe you need to just take a walk. And, um, you know, you, you were saying that you were really tired today. I got this. I got the next couple of phone calls. If you just need to like kick back for a minute and relax in your chair, knowing that your, your coworkers are also going to do that for you in return, that you have that level of support with each other. And so you're building this web of security with each other that extends to the patients and extends back. Staff are more likely to stay because they're not feeling overwhelmed and burnout out by, what's, um, by the environment that they're in. So it ends up leading to benefits for both the patients and the caregivers, and honestly, just the community as a whole, if we're able to see that underneath the exterior and the behaviors that we see, there's a story that we don't understand about other people unless we're, able to ask in a way that invites openness because we're being supportive and understanding. And that at its, been, at its core is really what autism informed care is really about. Um, so time for questions. And then also I can share a little bit about my background um, if there's interest there as well. All right, well, the first question I have is the question that everybody asks. Um, are you willing to share your slides with us? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So when you get a chance, you just email them to me and I'll take care of it from there. Sure. Um, yep, no and then after that, Dr. Bauer's slides will be available on DelawareMiniMed.org. And eventually the this presentation will be this video. It's not a video recording will be available on DelawareMiniMed.org too. Just not probably as soon as her slides will. Um, <laughs> one takes longer than the other. Um, Always. So, <laughs> First question I have for you, um, is there any help for anyone who went through this? And these are all the questions from the chat. Went, went through this in terms of trauma? Or? Um, yes, I think this was very early on in your, in your talk. Oh, maybe when we were talking about the ACEs, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So yes, there's lots of different types of therapy that can address trauma. And so, um, I think that what's really important is that you connect with a provider 
where you feel heard and supported. And, and that's sort of honestly the takeaway of this entire um, presentation is you need to have a relationship where you feel heard and supported and cared about and valued. And then you can work towards those therapeutic goals. Um, there's all there's there's a variety of different therapeutic interventions that address trauma, and if if it would be helpful to the group when I share my slides, I can also share some resources around um, trauma related therapies for people. Um, and so a lot of the therapies are around um, trauma. Can really one of the biggest ways that it impacts people is. Okay, resources would be good. Got it. Um, is around emotional regulation, and when, okay, so I I do this with my. I didn't think I was going to do this today, but I'm going to do it because I think it's really helpful. So I do this a lot with my patients. You can see I work with kids a lot. This is one of this is one of our offices. Um, so if this is your brain, if you had taken this brain is inside my head. This is where your ear is right here, and this is your forehead right here. Okay, so my fingers are the thinking part of your brain. Now, when everything is fine and everybody's feeling calm and regulated, so our emotions are in check, you can use the thinking part of your brain. When you become upset or dysregulated, it's called flipping your lid and your thinking part of your brain turns off and what's left is your limbic system. This is the emotional center of your brain. It's also the oldest part of your brain this is the part we share with like reptiles and other animals and things like that. You can't, no, you can't. You have a lot of difficulty being thoughtful and reasonable and plan and making plans when you're really overwhelmed. So think about the last time you were like really heated about something or you're really like very upset or sad um, or you're in an argument with somebody my experience, I have a lot of trouble forming my thoughts, being able to express them to other people, thinking about a way where we could come up to a reasonable solution together until those emotions are calmed. And that's a lot of what these therapies are about is noticing when your emotions get triggered, what triggers them, finding ways to calm those emotions. So this part gets soothed, just like you soothe little kids. You're really upset right now. You were so mad that your sister took your toys, whatever it happens to be, right? Calm, calm, calm. Okay. Body starts to relax. Brain starts working again. Now we start planning. Now we start um, talking about what can we do to fix it? Things like that. So that's really what the therapy is aimed at doing is helping people learn to control and regulate this part of their brain because it has been um, taught to over experience, it has, um, they've been, they've had, it doesn't work well, right? They have difficulty regulating that area so that they can remain the driver of their brain, right? So this is a part where I'm making plans and I'm being thoughtful about what I want to do. This part, I'm out of control. This part, I'm in charge. This part, I'm out of control. People with trauma are much easier, much tend to be more easily triggered into this area. And we want to help them gain control over their brain. So that's what therapy does. That is a great wow. That's thing. there's that's, a lot of there's a lot of comments coming in. <laughs> there's there's a lot of questions. I'm I'm keeping yeah. track of kind of when okay. they first, so I think we're okay. But bear with me. That is great. Okay. I'm going to use that for all the people I know in my life who um, flip their lid. I like that. Um, this comes from the Whole Brain Child. It's a book. It's on Amazon. It's super awesome, especially if you have kids. It gives some like neurobiological reasons why kids do what they do, but then it tells you what to do when kids flip their lid. That's, so, but it's also how adult brains work too. So it can be really helpful. Gonna buy that book. Um, this, these questions came at approximately the same time. How long is treatment and would medicine help? So probably also for the ACEs situation. Yeah, um, it depends is the best answer to that. Um, trauma therapy usually is um, something that is, ongoing, right? Because trauma, not only does it, can it rewire your brain and change brain connections? So you have to sort of untrain your brain, but it makes you the whole brain child. Yeah, exactly. Um, it 
also leads you leads people to expect that new people that they meet are going to treat them in a way similar to people that they have dealt with in the past. So if someone it can and it can be things that triggering events can be things that we don't even typically think about the eye contact that somebody made with you, that they brushed up against you in a way that reminds you of something that happened in the past. And you may not even be conscious that that is happening and causing you to feel triggered, um, especially for young children who experience trauma. Um, it, the, the, those experiences are in their body, especially for kids that, that can't really express themselves yet they feel their, their body remembers that trauma. So when they have touch that is some way similar to the trauma they've experienced in the past, it can be triggering for them. So maybe children who've experienced physical abuse um, at a young age, or maybe somebody grabs their hand, that can be very triggering and cause a response that that person would not even imagine um, if they don't know that person's trauma history. So um, there's a lot of it's very individualized. Um, medication can help if there's things like anxiety, depression, um, mood instability, things like that that are associated with that. But it's very there's no, it's not it's not cookie cutter. It's very individualized. So that's why I say find somebody that you really trust. That's the most important part of therapy. There are lots of questions. I see that. Yes, Dan Siegel. Yes, very much. Yep, that's the whole brainchild. Um, um, yes, Tiffany so Fine Brayson. Yep. The, yes, the book. It was asked, you know, can you share the title, "The Whole Brain Child"? So yes, that's and what, the body keeps the score. Yes, another great book. All right, cool. We have so, a very informed crowd. I love it. You. This is great. You're doing my work for me. Thank you. Hey, you know, we do what we can. Um, so then, I guess the next question. A lot of the these are are very similar. So I'll I'll ask one, and maybe we can get there. How much of a difference in neural wiring development is there when a patient is exposed to trauma as a baby versus say a two-year-old or maybe like an older child? Um, again, I think it depends. It depends on the child. It depends on um, like the intensity and duration of the trauma. Um, so the kids are really malleable. Right, and they adopt, they adapt to their environments. Um, for kids that are pre-verbal, so before they can talk, so before about age two, if they experience trauma, they're going to then, that's the, the piece about um, the holding it in your body, right, that your, that your body remembers that experience. And for those kiddos, sometimes it's actually very difficult to ever make that experience verbal because their brain, didn't know how to do that. That's why you don't really have memories before you're two. Your brain doesn't know how to do that. Um, and so they experience and hold that in a very different way. And there's different therapy related to that. Um, for kids that are like two to five, that's really when you fundamentally figure out how people are gonna treat you in the world, right? If the people in your life, that's why like birth to three and, you know, or um, birth to five before preschool is so, so important. If the people in your life at that age were kind and supportive and encouraging of you. You see this, the world as this place of opportunity where people are going to help you along the way. And, um, you know, all of these great things are possible. If you lived in a world where people hurt you, especially people that were supposed to take care of you, they criticized you, they left you, that's the world. And that's what everybody else is going to do. Um, and then as kids get older and older, they start to understand you're not supposed to do that to people. Why are they doing that to me? There must be something wrong with me that's making people hurt me. And so then they sort of start to attribute it to themselves. Um, and so there's different ways that trauma can be experienced by people. And some people experience all of those traumas, right? Um, and so it's important to kind of unravel what they were. And for some people, their trauma experience is significant enough that they have difficulty remembering those experiences or just really didn't have enough emotional energy to make memories at that age. So unpacking and unraveling all that can be very difficult. Okay. 
there's a lot of questions and I'm trying yeah, to I see that. Know, yeah. lots of lots of different kinds um perhaps an easy one is this is is your your practice being practiced at multiple hospitals at only one hospital where are you you know where are you based out of and and is there a similar program elsewhere so um so my program is not necessarily like a trauma-informed care therapeutic program. So my program serves people who have autism. It's in the Wilmington Hospital. Um, that's where we're out of. We also um, do some work in some of the other hospitals. Um, in terms of trauma-informed care, that is something that um, hospital staff are trained in. Um, and so we're sort of at the um depending on what practice you're in, but sort of as the hospital system as a whole, there's awareness and information, um, but maybe not intensive training for every practitioner. Mental health for the for the most part is, is very well versed in this. Okay. Questions keep coming. I love it, but yeah. I gotta find them. Um, <laughs> you gotta prioritize, yeah. <laughs> what, is the, what is the best advice to give to someone who has friends or family dealing with trauma? What's the best advice I could give a friend or a family? Um, just be available and listen. Um, people are gonna talk at their own time, but people are only gonna talk or share in a place where they feel safe. And sometimes people don't need to talk. Sometimes people don't need to share their trauma. Sometimes they just need a safe place to be. And being that place or being that person where they have sort of like sanctuary. And I know somebody put out the sanctuary model, but if you are a safe person where they can just be, that's the most important thing that you could do for somebody. I would also say, be very aware of if you have concerns about um, any suicidal behaviors um, to make sure those um, Asking if somebody is feeling suicidal will not make them become suicidal, but it opens up the doorway for you, for them to be able to share um, and to for you to be able to get them help. Um, well, this is a pretty good one. Does the level of care, try again, does the level of caregiving differ based on the degree of trauma or based on the point someone begins treatment? Or I'm not sure I understand the question. So does the, like, does the, you mean, does the amount of treatment that they would get for their trauma depend on how much trauma it was or when it happened? I, I think I mean? it means, does it depend on how much trauma it, want, it was or at what point they decide enough is enough and they want to have treatment? So if, you know, if the trauma happened mm -hmm. was bad and happened last week versus the trauma was bad and happened, you know, four years ago or whatever, is. Um, I think it depends. So there's things like, um, so PTSD, right? A lot of people have heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, so it's most commonly thought of for like say combat veterans and think people who have experienced violence, they've experienced um, severe weather, like they were in a hurricane and um, it was a life-threatening event. Um, people who were in the towers for 9-11, things like that, these, these traumatic, huge events, and they re-experience the event or they try to avoid things that might remind them of those events. Um, PTSD can also come from these other traumas that we talked about where um, it causes severe emotional impact or um, a fear of death. So maybe if someone is physically hurting you, that it's, um, you fear that you could die from that, right? So post-traumatic stress disorder isn't technically post-traumatic stress disorder until you've experienced, you're, some, you're somewhat distant from the actual trauma and the event. It's called something different when it's called acute stress disorder, when it's um, in a shorter period of time. And, and some of that is, for lack of a better, better term, like it hasn't settled all the way in. Like it hasn't seeped all the way in to see how it's gonna affect the person across um, all areas of their life. And there are some interventions at a very early stage to try and help the person not um, have that trauma impact so many aspects of their lives and give them coping skills very early on. Um, and that's why like 
therapists go um, to accident scenes like hurricane scenes and to try and or um, mass shooting scenes and things like that to try and help the people right away. For some people that's helpful, for some people that's not that helpful. Um, there's different techniques that you might use when it's been like more ongoing trauma or it's um, more distant because the person has been like holding that experience for a really long time and it has become sort of part of their person and their experience. I hope that answers the question. It answered mine. I hope it answered the question. <laughs> How about, there have been a couple questions. What can be done for people that have um, treatment or medication resistant disorders? Um, so if therapy and medication don't work for a patient, then, then what's their alternative? Um, and I, so we're definitely like delving into the mental health part, which I think is important. Um, I do wanna like point out the caveat that when we're talking about trauma-informed care, this is also can apply to things like physical symptoms, that maybe are very medication resistant because it's not actually, maybe the physical symptoms are a manifestation of their emotional problems, right? So um, you've had chronic pain and we've tried a zillion different things and it's not addressing the chronic pain. Maybe the chronic pain is your body's way of dealing with these negative emotions. And so therapy might be the response. Um, um, if treatment is, has not been helpful. Um, again, I do think it's really important and I can't stress this enough. I actually recommend people, I loosely, I say this therapist shop because it's like test drive a car, right? If you are going to be open and vulnerable enough to share your most personal experiences with another person and you don't, you don't feel comfortable with that person, then maybe they're not a good fit and that's okay. Most therapists will go, that's okay. You should find somebody that's a better fit for you because we don't all match with everybody. Um, so I think some of it could be that, that there's some sort of a, a mismatch that is not allowing um, for that person to share those uh, feelings. And it may also be that that person just doesn't have the right specialty and training, right? So we don't all specialize in everything. Um, and so that's really important. There are lots and lots of different medications available. There's no medication to treat trauma. There's medications that can treat symptoms resulting from trauma, like anxiety or depression, um, inattention, things like that, mood instability. But there's not just like I work with autism. There's no medication for autism. There's medications for behaviors related to autism, but I can't give a pill to get rid of autism. I can't give a pill to get rid of trauma. Um, and so you really need that safe team to get it done. I know there's a question in the chat um, that said, um, you know, due to the pandemic, is online learning, especially at the elementary school level, going to be considered a traumatic event and how is it going to be addressed? And I know Tim had a question about the That's COVID pandemic point. too. Tim, why don't you see if you can yeah. flag that on? All right. So one of the things that we've been talking about since the beginning of the pandemic are the uh, the population wide uh, emotional psychological impacts of, you know, chronic stress being cooped up inside, uh, yes. sometimes with people who you really don't want to be cooped up <laughs> with. Uh, right. it, you know, it's it, it's been quite a ride. And so we're starting to apply these principles that you've been talking about and how we think about population-wide trauma uh, and how we in turn ramp up public health, ramp out public health interventions. So again, with the current pandemic, uh, we're involved right now in a big project using community health workers mm -hmm. to continue to dive further and further down into those vaccine hesitant populations who at this point have had two and a half plus years of anxiety to build up and, you know, political and uh, media yep. swaying one way or another. So just acknowledging that this isn't just an individual level thing uh, yeah. a, 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 as you were. And, and so, you know, 
I guess my question is looking forward, this is sort of unprecedented. 9-11 affected Americans uh, mm -hmm. for sure, but how long do you think we're gonna see sequelae rippling out for this? Are we gonna have trauma for life in some people? Um, for some people, yeah, I think that we will. So um, if you think about the pandemic, the pandemic is the first time in a hundred years, well, in terms of like a, a health related global crisis, right? The last time was in what, 1918 or something like that. There was, there was the big flu, right? Um, the other global things have been World War I, World War II, right? These are life-changing events for the entire population of the world. Um, now, for, so what we're dealing with is called collective trauma. Usually the trauma that we've been talking about is individually experienced trauma. I had these experiences as a child and they affected me individually. Collective trauma is something everyone, a large group of people goes through. So it could be things like a hurricane or a mass shooting or something for that group of people. But this is, this is an experience the entire world is going through in, in various ways. Um, and some of the things that, I'm because I know we're gonna be cognizant of time, I'm gonna try and be brief. Um, so with collective trauma, not everyone experiences it the same way. So um, for instance, um, when the Spanish flu, yes, thank you, 1912. Um, when the pandemic hit and our hospital essentially shut down for, um, I am called ambulatory, so I'm like outpatient. I went home, I did everything virtually. I'm very familiar with Zoom. It's like my best friend. Um, and I lived at home and I never left my home. My husband did all the grocery shopping because he still had to work at his office. So he's like, I'm already out. Might as well be the one that's out. My kids were on Zoom. And that was very stressful for me. I didn't have anybody in my family contract COVID um, at that time. I didn't have anyone in my family die. I didn't contract COVID. Um, I don't have long haul symptoms. I don't have, I didn't lose my job. Um, I didn't, my husband didn't lose his job. I didn't have any of these serious ramifications that so many people in the world did, but I experienced it in my way. And my way had an impact on me. It was different than a lot of other people. Um, and so I think we also tend to want to compare our experience to other people as either worse or I shouldn't really even be upset about this because it wasn't as bad as other people had it. Um, and um, so there's, there's that questioning of like, is my experience worthy of being upset about? I think people will, will be dealing with those remnants for a long time. Um, there were also little, th <laughs> um, uh, there were also, um, sorry, I'm just laughing at that. Yeah, we're going to be here. Until 11 <laughs> we might be here longer than 8 <laughs> Um, so, um, everyday life changed, right? We always talk about the new normal now, right? I don't know if you remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, this was a very significant, like it was, I was like, whoa, um, at the very beginning, because I had always been taught you hold the door open for people and let them pass by. I did that. And people looked at me like I was trying to murder them by breathing on them with this contagious disease that was going to kill all of humanity. And I was like, oh, all the social rules just changed. Uh oh, and all the things that we knew to do, you now couldn't do. You couldn't, you couldn't shake a new person's hand. You couldn't hug your family. You had to stay in across the street to talk to your neighbor, right? All of these ways. And we just, we, we pulled apart our social connections for safety, right? So can you imagine instead of safety is being connected, safety is being separate. We're going to have to undo that for kids because they don't, they don't know. Some of them don't have never lived in a world where that wasn't true. Okay. I okay. said I would try to be short. I'm very bad at being short. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> there have been a couple questions about generational trauma. So yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not going to ask both of them, but um, things like, um, oh, where is it? So, um, yeah. Um, well, I could kind of comment on generational trauma. trauma. 
Yeah, a little like bit. inherited trauma and epigenetic changes will successful treatment and the legacy of a distress that a traumatized parent bestows on their child. Um, Maybe, yeah. and that is the goal. Okay, so intergenerational trauma, briefly, as briefly as I can. Um, uh, let's say a grandparent of that generation experienced uh, extreme trauma. Um, so I can, I have a, a specific example in mind. So um, a young girl who was physically and emotionally abused her entire life, um, you know, beaten with a stick, um, ber berated for any decision that she made, um, told all sorts of terrible things about herself, um, internalized that. Um, was not able to be vulnerable with other people, had difficulty um, making relationships, married a young man who had, um, whose parents had died when he was young. So he was an orphan. Um, he joined the military when he was like 15, sneakily, so that he would have a place to belong. And all he wanted was a family. And all she couldn't really do was be in a family with somebody. Um, and then they had two children. Um, and so the way that she learned to, to be cared for as a child is how she cared for her children. So she was also emotionally and physically abusive towards them. Um, they were also both boys who were triggering to her because she had been abused by her father. So that reminded her of that abuse that she had experienced. Um, one of them had significant mental health needs. And so um, he was very needy in a lot of ways um, and she was not able to care for him. Um, and then they had children, but along the way, so what's interesting is the, the, the son who had emotional or had um, mental health needs had three children who continue sort of along that line and have, they have their own mental health needs. They, he parented them the way that he was parented um, and they continue to parent their children in the same way. Um, and it's because the grandchildren, um, or live in an environment where there's a little bit more awareness of that, they're trying to undo that themselves and with some therapy. Um, the, the other son um, in the scenario had a child, got married, had a child, has some of those same behaviors, but actively works to right them. So, you know, you can get mad at people who are around you. You can yell at them, snap out, right? Repair is what's important. Right. So, you, you know, you also have to be safe and I'm not advocating that you get upset with other people, but um, we all get upset. It's important that you repair with that person and you are specific in your apology and you're genuine about it. And you work to fix it in the future. And that family did. And that grandson continues to have some of the um, sort of impulsive, angry behaviors that run in this family and he actively checks them when they happen with active repair behaviors which reduce the likelihood that that gets transmitted but it's only with active attempts to change that behavior that it stops being transmitted down to the next generation all right um two questions dealing with the the self so i'll try and like smush them all in and and guys we are almost at 8 30 so if if anybody has to leave at 8 30 that's totally fine um i don't know dr bauer when you need to get off and just tell me and i'll stop i can say a little bit yeah um so the first is that is there such thing as a self-inflicted trauma and how the second is how would you handle a situation if someone felt like their identity is tied to their trauma hmm I'm going to take the second one first. Go for it. Um, I think that's actually more common than you would think. Um, for people to, um, so there can be things people can um, identify with their trauma, maybe because it garners them sympathy or connects them to a specific community of survivors um, and allows for a community that they never had. Um, it, um, for some people, and I, I want to be really careful about how I say this, um, it can allow um, the trauma to um, 
to be responsible for their current behavior, right? So um, in, instead of I was impulsively angry and snapped, I'm going to own that behavior. It may be because of my trauma, but I'm going to own it and repair it not like allowing it to not allowing the person not to own that behavior. So there are some reasons why people might do that. Therapies are, I can't go back to therapy, but therapy is a really great way to help people identify when that's happening in the moment. And I'll give them some education, some resources, some support, some coping skills, all those kinds of things to offer a different choice of being, right? And that you don't have to give up a trauma community because you no longer are allowing your trauma to identify you. Um, that means that you are a person with trauma, not a traumatized person, right? So like, which one are you, your trauma, or are you, do you own your trauma? Um, can you self-inflict trauma? Yes. So I'm trying to think of, so, um, for example, if maybe a choice you have made led to some really negative consequences for maybe yourself or for somebody that you care about. And that is, um, that is lasting for you. That could be self-inflicted trauma, right? So um, I'm completely making this up, but let's say it was a person who um, was a drunk driver and they killed somebody while driving and they are traumatized by the decision that they made and the actions that they made and the ramifications that that has had, that can certainly have a lasting traumatic impact. Um, and some of that is actually allowing, the, the treatment is around allowing the person to redevelop self-love and acceptance of that that has happened and that was a choice that you made um, in, a, in a similar way that you might sort of find acceptance, not forgiveness necessarily, maybe for an abuser kind of thing. Okay. Um, are there certain minorities or groups of people who are more susceptible to trauma in general? Is it more commonly found among men versus women? Is, is there any commonality there to trauma? Yeah, so um, trauma happens, uh, it's ubiquitous, right? It could happen to anybody. However, um, individuals who do not have the same level of power in our, in our society are more likely to experience trauma. Women, individuals with disabilities, marginalized people like LGBTQ plus individuals, things like that, um, minorities, um, those with less economic means, they, these groups tend to experience trauma more often for a couple of reasons, um, sort of societal and systemic situations that keep them in a, in a less powerful situation are more likely to cause um, problems in the community, um, economic disadvantage, housing differences, increased in um, incarceration rates, things like that that are traumatic events. Um, individuals who are perceived as having less power are more likely to be victimized by people who want to assert their power as well. Um, that does not mean that white males who are not disabled and who are, um, you know, uh, don't have other identifying um, differences from the, the most empowered groups don't experience trauma, um, but these other groups are more likely to. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to um, stop the questions. There are still a lot of questions and there They're are still really great questions, but we can't get to all of them. So um, I, I don't know, Dr. Bauer, do you want to um, have your contact information or? Um, how about um, if, it, if it would work, if you wouldn't mind, I've done this in the past when I've done like Facebook Live, if you collect questions and then we could communicate and you could share them back with the group, yeah, would that. that work? Yep. Okay. Because um, there looks like there's lots of really good questions. There are indeed. And I have to say, there's a lot of really nice support between all of the participants towards each other, not only resources, but like compassion towards other people's experiences. And um, I mean, that is the takeaway of this. So it's, it's really nice to see an experience with people that are likely strangers to each other. There's hope in the world. Yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, I think that's it for this evening. Um, I do want to give a couple of last minute um, info things. The uh, I'll share my screen so you can see it. The website has been updated at DelawareMinimed.org. Um, so here's just DelawareMinimed.org. Um, you can go there. This is where you will find the PDFs. This is where you will find the recordings once we put them up. Um, next week, we are going to be chatting with um, Dr. Stephanie Catterson. She's going to talk about breast reconstruction and plastic surgery. And if you didn't hear the first time, um, the, the word of the day today is snow, but you only need to do it if you're on the phone. If you are if you were on Zoom and you put your name in the chat, that's enough. You do, I don't need everybody to email me. That's going to be a lot of emails. So just if you're on the phone, the word of the day is snow. And we will see everybody next Thursday. Uh, you can use the same link as you used to sign in for today. All right. So have a lovely evening, everybody. It was good to see you all.